from the peculiar and particular message of repentance, true repentance. And of course, in the words of Jesus Christ, He said it's either repent or go to hell. That makes it very obvious that every preacher should preach on repentance. It's mentioned in the New Testament some 70 times. It's a word that most people do not like to hear. Most preachers have rejected. You don't hear them use it much anymore. Amen. Most of them used to preach on it, but somehow because of the loss in popularity, the loss in revenue, they have succumbed and compromised to this modern day philosophy that all you have to do is believe. But the fact about the matter is believing is a verb of action and it implies repentance as well as believing. It is not intellectual. It is of the will. And that will must be exercised in repentance and in finding God in eternal life. Jesus Christ does not come on the, uh, the well, that old bargain counter block and in some variety store where you can pick Him up real easy. No, He comes at a cost. He says, I demand everything. I want to begin with a scripture that Jesus gave to His disciples, the apostles, in Luke the 24th chapter, one of His last commandments. It's found in Luke 24, beginning in verse 45. The scripture says, Jesus opened their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. And He said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer, and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in His name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem, and your witnesses of these things. Now the Lord gave a commission here to His apostles, and they in turn were to transfer that message to you and I. It is transferred to us in the Holy Bible. The Bible tells us plainly, in Ephesians 2 and 20 that we're built upon the foundation of the words of the apostles, the words of the holy prophets, and the words of Jesus Christ. We cannot alone accept just the words of Christ or the words of the apostles or the words of the prophets. We're built upon the foundation of the words of all three of these ministers. Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone that holds the prophets their word and the words of the apostles together. And the commandment of Jesus was that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in His name among all nations and they must begin at Jerusalem. This fully, this commission was carried out. And it has been carried out ever since as Jesus said, preach it unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Now repentance is not a matter of of convenience. It is not a matter of your opinion. It is a matter that is vital to every person on this planet. And we read in the 13th chapter of this same great book of Luke, the narrator and the apostle, or the writer of this great book of the Gospels, the scripture says in Luke 13 and 3, Jesus said, I tell you nay, but except you repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Amen. And he's not talking about dying a natural or physical death. He is talking about a spiritual death of going to hell. Either repent, and that word repentance has a lot of definitions and implications that is not brought out clearly among the theologians and preachers of this generation, may I say sorrowfully. Amen. Repentance is a great word. Repentance means that you quit what you're doing and do something else. Repentance means a change of mind. Repentance means that you turn around and go in the opposite direction from the way that you're going and doing the things that you're doing. And it has a great meaning that the Bible brings forth forcefully and calls to our attention that preachers do not call our attention to today. Now in the ninth chapter of Matthew, and also the life of the ministry of Jesus Christ. I'd like to call your attention to the ninth chapter in verse 10. It came to pass as Jesus said it meet in the house of one of a man named Matthew, a publican. Behold, many publicans and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto his disciples, Why eateth your master with publicans and sinners? Now this was a great shock to the religious people of the day of Christ himself. They thought that Jesus would only associate with the righteous. Well, unfortunately, He didn't find very many righteous. That's why God sent Him in such a time 
as the first advent when he appeared to the church of old. And the scripture says in John 1 pathetically, he came into his own and his own received him not. But the next verse gave hope to those that were not uh, really the people that had received the covenant of his grace. But the scripture goes on and said, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, who were born not of the flesh, nor of blood, nor of the will of man, but of God. Amen. Praise God. Jesus came to his own, and his own received him not. Now, instead of associating with the religious of his day, we find Jesus Christ was a friend of publicans, that's tax collectors or crooks, you might say, and sinners. And when Jesus heard them say this, he said, They that be whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. And he's not talking about a doctor, he's talking about somebody healing the soul and the spirit of man. But go ye and learn what meaneth this. I will have mercy and not sacrifice. <coughs> now here is why Jesus came. For I am not come to call the righteous, but I have come to call sinners to what? To repentance. Amen. He didn't call them just to stand up and say, I believe. That's right. If you believe, you repent. That's if you right. don't believe, you won't repent and Amen. turn away and give up your sins, quit sinning, Amen. and do an about face and walk with God in a righteous manner that Jesus Christ gives you that power to do through the new birth. Now, the Bible is very clear in its demand that we repent or perish. In Romans, the second chapter, the beloved Apostle Paul, and he was a great man of God, he says in verse 4 of Romans 2, he said, Despisest thou the riches of his goodness and his forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. If God is good to you, if God wants to show you goodness, it's not going to be to come down to give you a Cadillac or a trip to Las Vegas or some great sum of money. If God shows His goodness to you, it's the goodness of God that will lead you to repent Amen. so you won't perish in hell. That's God's goodness. We sing here songs saying, God is a good God. And His goodness He will show to you. But I tell you, God is a good God to turn us away from our sins, from our old ways, which are not His ways, as a prophet cried out. In Isaiah 55, 6 through 9, He says, Seek ye the Lord while He may be found. Call upon Him while He is near. Let the wicked forsake His way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. And let him return unto the Lord. And He'll have mercy upon him and to our God, for He will abundantly pardon why does God want to part the next two verses? For your ways are not my ways, and your thoughts are not my thoughts, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. When a person comes to God, repentance means that he renounce what he's doing. And that word of repentance to renounce means you renounce your sins. You renounce and forsake the world, the sins of the flesh, and the devil in every form and fashion. And when you come to Jesus Christ for eternal life in repentance, there's no parling, there's no compromise, there's no bargaining with God in, to come to Jesus Christ. Christ demands absolute renunciation and a turning away from all sin and all the sins of the flesh in your life and He will accept no halfway bargaining with Him. There's no bargaining plea except to say, I'm guilty. And I've come to you for your mercy. Yes. The first message of Jesus Christ. And the Lord sent him to preach to us a message of salvation. And how to get back into favor with God. The world, the church of old had lost its way. The leaders were blind, Jesus said. The blind were leading the blind that were falling into the ditch. And God saw this terrible situation existing. That even the preachers were blind and leading people further into the pit. Instead of away and from the pit and from the dangers of the flesh and the sins they were committing that were leading them to destruction. And the Bible tells us when Jesus appeared in Mark the first chapter, verse 14, the scripture says after John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent you and believe the gospel. You can't even believe the gospel until you really repent. And repentance opens the door into the kingdom of God for you to enter in 
and to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that He suffered on that cross and shed His blood for your redemption. And until you repent, you cannot believe that from your heart. Amen. It's only an intellectual assent that will not save you. That's the Bible says in Mark, or rather Romans the 10th chapter, verses 9 and 10, for the Scripture, and this is a great Scripture on salvation, that man believeth unto righteousness. For with a heart man believeth unto righteousness. And with a mouth confession is made unto salvation. It's with a heart. And that middle assent that we give that Jesus is Christ will not save an individual. We must believe from the heart. And anything you believe from the heart, you will continuously make an effort to continue in what you said you believe. For it's with a heart, Jesus said, man believeth unto righteousness. And Jesus also said, out of the heart cometh adulteries, fornications, murders, evil thoughts, concupiscence, if you know what all that is, lasciviousness, blasphemy, pride, an evil, uh, evil eye, foolishness. He said all of these things come from him from within, out of the heart of man, and they defile the man. That heart must be changed, and from the heart we must believe and repent to God, and then turn to Jesus Christ for His love and mercy. The great Apostle Paul, speaking of what he was preaching in his day, I think it's recorded very adequately here to impress even the most skeptical of a religious-minded person in Acts the 20th chapter. In the 20th verse of Acts 20, he begins, he said, I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, and have showed you, and have showed you publicly, and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and to the Greeks, repentance toward God, repentance toward God, and then faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Let me tell you, Jesus said, no man cometh to the Father but by me. If you're going to get to the Father, you're going to have to do what Jesus said. And Jesus said, unless you repent to God the Father and then believe on Him as your Lord and Master, you don't find eternal life. You are not accepted into the kingdom of God. Even though some preacher may tell you, have told you that you are acceptable. We must believe the words of Jesus Christ and His apostles. They made it very obvious. Also in the 26th chapter of Acts, there's a very wonderful and vital scripture that we must take advantage of learning something here from the great apostle in verse 19 in Acts 26 Paul was preaching in the Roman court and here was King Agrippa the king he was preaching before and he says in verse 19 he said oh King Agrippa I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision but showed first unto them of Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coast of Judah, Judea, and then to the Gentiles. Now what did he preach? That they should repent and turn to God and do works meet or necessary for repentance. I'll tell you there's some works that are necessary to show that we repented. And this going around saying I'm saved without, without having some fruit to bear witness of the fact that you have been born again, that you have repented, so, certainly many times manifest more the fact that we truly haven't repented by the life we live. Amen. If our life does not measure up to the Word of God, then don't doubt the Word of God. Doubt your experience that you claim to have. I'll tell you that so many people's got experiences that don't harmonize with God's Word. They go around doubting the Bible instead of doubting their own sorry experience that they claim to have received from the Lord. Amen. If your experience does not conform to the Word of God, doubt your experience. Amen. Don't doubt the Bible and get one that conforms to the Word of God. John the Baptist, one of the greatest preachers of any age. Now listen to what he said. I love this fellow. He, he, he preceded Jesus Christ in preaching repentance. And here's what he had to say about this vital message of true repentance or repent or perish. In Matthew the third chapter verse 7, he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees. See, there's those religious people. They claim to be saved, but they wasn't. When he, they came to his baptism. You ought to be baptized, but they don't save you. Baptism unto repentance is what the Bible teaches and preaches for salvation. You repent first and then you get baptized. I'm talking about what genuinely saves you. 
Baptism doesn't save you. It only is a part of your submitting and obeying the commands of the Lord. There's a lot of things you do after you repent. There's a lot of things you do. You straighten up your life. Yeah. You go to church. You read your Bible. You pay your tithes and give offerings. You do a lot of things. But it doesn't save you. It's repentance that leads you to God. It's the goodness of God that leads a man or woman to repentance to save them from the wrath of God. Alright? He saw these Pharisees, Sadducees, religious leaders come out to be baptized. And he said to them, Oh man, what a preacher. He turned insult to injury real quick here to these fellows. He said, you generation of vipers who have warned you to flee from the wrath to come. To those preachers that had hoodwinked people. And here was his demand. Verse 8. Bring forth therefore fruits, meat or necessary for repentance. Don't come out here and tell me that you birds have repented and believed and are saved. Show me. Amen. Bring me some fruit to prove Amen. that you're a real born again Amen. Christian. Right. Amen. Show me you've repented. Live the lifestyle that reflects a repented life, a heart that is believed unto the righteousness of Jesus Christ. The heart is speaking of being <coughs> totally affected. Your mind, body, soul, and spirit is totally yielded to the Spirit of God in full surrender to Him. True repentance and faith go hand in hand. You can't have true repentance without saving faith. And you can't have saving faith without true repentance. They go together. And repentance must come before you receive God's love and mercy and grace in your life. You're not going to get God's mercy and grace and love until you have repented. Right. That leads you to the goodness of God. Repentance. That means you quit your sin. You don't come and just apologize and say, Lord, I'm sorry I got caught. Man, I prayed with folks in jail. Prayed with folks in the hospital dying with terrible diseases. And all of them is sorry. Their sins have caught up with them. You say, sins? Is that reason they're there? Yep. It sure is. The Bible teaches that sin is the root of all the trouble in the human family. Amen. It's sin. Amen. One little deadly word. And God sent Jesus Christ to deliver us from our sins so we know how to suffer the fate of so many people. God have mercy. You believe the Bible. If you don't believe the Bible, you haven't got anything to even start trying to find God through. You find Him through the Word. And God tells you how to find Him in the book, which is the Bible. And you're not going to find God's love and mercy and grace. It's there. It's like a big ocean. But you're not going to get to it until you repent and come back God. As Paul said in the Acts of the 20, chapter 17 and 18, he said, I've taught you repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. You don't have true repentance without saving faith and you don't have saving faith without truly repenting. And it's not of yourself. It is a gift from God that God through the Holy Spirit of, and of conviction comes upon you and leads you to that point that you can truly repent of your sins. Give them up. Turn about face a 180 degree. Turn and go the other way and leave them stupid defiling and destructive sins behind you. You can't do it unless the Holy Ghost draws. You want a scripture for proof? Here's one. 2 Corinthians 7 and 10. For godly sorrow worketh repentance unto salvation not to be repented of or not to regret, but the sorrow of this world worketh death. That means you perish. You just sorry you got caught. It don't mean you come up and apologize. An apology doesn't work with God. Repentance means that you renounce your sins and you forsake your sins. Amen. Proverbs 28, 13 said, He that covereth his sins shall not prosper. But whoso confesseth and forsaketh them Amen. shall have mercy. Right. You're not going to get mercy by confessing them, but by forsaking them. Amen. You quit them. Amen. You renounce them. Amen. And you hate them like God hates them. Amen. You cannot walk with God unless you hate sin. It's got to be despicable to you. Repentance means to renounce it, to give it up. There's no parley, no bargain, no compromise that God will accept from you. Salvation is, not, is of grace and of faith. However, if the sacrifice of Christ on that cross where He shed His blood is to be made effective for any, any individual of any age, 
that individual must repent of sin and accept Christ by that saving faith that God imparts to him by grace. For it we are saved by grace through faith. And that's not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. Not of works. Lest any man should boast. Repentance is not a works. Repentance is a grace of God. The mercy of God that has led you to that point that you can renounce your sins. Yeah. Turn your back on them. Walk off and leave them. Yes. And take up your cross and follow Christ through the new man that came in you. When you repent, Jesus will come into your heart. Yeah. And He won't come into your heart until you repent. Amen. He don't live in no sinful heart. Right. You've got to renounce your Praise sins. Be God. Jonah preached in Nineveh. That little book over lays in the middle of the Old Testament. Got a beautiful story. How Jonah went down to Nineveh at the command of the Lord, preached to them, said 40 days and God will overthrow you. Jesus came along later in the New Testament. He said, Behold, one greater than Jonah is here. So you remember how Jonah went to Nineveh? And Nineveh repented at the preaching of Jonah, but you won't repent when one greater than Jonah is here to preach to you. Amen. Nineveh re repented when Jonah preached to them of God's judgment that He would destroy them in 40 days. Ezekiel preached repentance to the church of old. In Ezekiel 18, beginning in verse 30, God said, Therefore, I will judge you, O house of Israel, every man according to his ways. Therefore, turn from your sins before iniquity become your ruin. Repent of them. That's what repent means, to turn away. Turn away. Renounce and turn away from those sins that is bringing ruin and will cause you to perish in the pits of hell. I will judge you, O house of Israel. Turn and repent before destruction comes upon you. John preached repentance, of course. In John the third, or rather Matthew the third chapter, beginning in verse 7, he said, Bring forth fruit, therefore meat for repentance. Then he says, Don't think to say within yourselves, We have Abraham for our father. For God is able of these stones to raise up children of Abraham. If you don't repent, God will raise up stones to get up here and praise Him and serve Him Amen. and be holy in His Amen. sight through old-fashioned repentance. And I tell you, you'll never live a holy life until you do repent. Christ's right. apostles preach repentance. In Acts the second chapter, in verse 38, the old apostle Peter, on the day of Pentecost, stood up and said, Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, every one of you, for the remission of sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Repent, and then be baptized as the commands of Jesus Christ and the apostles. And it's both scriptural, and it's both vital, by the way. You don't have a right, you don't have a right to ignore, or in any wise try to avoid water baptism, just because that's not actually what converted you and brought you to God. Jesus said when John the Baptist saw him coming out to his baptism, John said, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. And Jesus, He came and said, I want you to baptize me and suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. And then John baptized Jesus. Well, you know baptism didn't save Jesus. He was already saved. Amen. He was born without sin. He's a sinless one. But He said, It's necessary to fulfill all the righteousness of God. And likewise it is in your life and mine. In Acts the third chapter, in verse 19, another great message by the Apostle Peter began with said, Repent and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. If you want that old account of sin, of sinful life, all those mistakes, all of those terrible sins that you've committed that you're ashamed for people to know, if you want to blot it out and cast in the sea of forgetfulness, that God will never judge you. That you'll never be shamed, nor or you'll be punished for those sins. The only way to avoid the punishment and judgment of God is to repent and get them under the blood of Jesus where the Father God does not see them anymore. He doesn't look upon your sins when they're under the blood of Jesus Christ. They're buried. He never brings them back to memory again. And how wonderful it is to leave the presence of Jesus Christ after you repented. And feel clean yes. and guiltless right. and holy. Praise God, and you got the joy of the Lord in you, and all the fear of judgment and hell is gone. And you
you'll never lose it until you have repented, renounced your sins, quit your sinning, and turned away and began living a new life. In Mark the 6th chapter and verse 12, the apostles went out and preached that men should repent. And they cast out many devils and anointed with all them that were sick and healed them. The disciples of Jesus Christ, one of the commandments that Jesus gave them, you preach repentance. They preached it. They weren't like preachers today, like dumb dogs that refuse to do what the Bible has commanded them through Christ and the apostles to do. Jesus told them to go out and re preach repentance to all the nations beginning at Jerusalem. Amen. In His own lifetime, Jesus preached repent or perish. Here the disciples went out from Christ and they went out and preached that men should repent, quit sinning, give up their sins, renounce their sins, and start living a holy life through the power of the resurrected Jesus Christ that came into their hearts. Paul preached repentance. And I think this is one of the greatest messages in the Word of God. I want you to take a look at it in Acts the 17th chapter, beginning in verse 30. I tell you, this is, this is a great preacher, this man Paul. I love him, and I like to emulate anything I can about his lifestyle and his message. In the times of this ignorance, God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Does that include you and me? Amen. Your mama, your neighbor? Amen. The governor, the president, his cabinet, the judges, and everybody? Yes, yes. yes it does. Jew and Amen. Greek, black and white, bond and free, male and female, Amen. rich and God. poor, everybody. Amen. God said He commands everybody to yes. repent or perish. That means renounce your sin. Give up your sin. Quit your sin. Amen. And walk away from it. Praise, Praise God. God. And live a holy life through the power of the Christ that comes into your heart and life. Why should you renounce your sins? It tells you in verse 31, because God has appointed the day in the which He will judge the world in righteousness by that man which He hath ordained, whereof He hath given assurance unto all men, in that He hath raised Him from the dead. He said, hey, there's coming a day God's going to judge you for your sins. Hebrews 9, 27, the same old apostle wrote, It is appointed unto man once to die, and after that, the judgment. God's going to judge you for every sin you committed. The only way to get rid of those sins is repent or perish in divine judgment. My Lord, the great apostle Peter preached repent or perish. In 2 Peter, the third chapter and verse 9, God... He's not slack concerning His promises. Some men count slackness. God's not slack. God's not tolerant. You can't find a word in the Bible about God's tolerance. He's long-suffering. He'll wait on you a lot of times. But He's not tolerating your sin. He's got a record up there. Every sin, every act of rebellion, every lust of the flesh, every time you curse, every time you take a drink, every time you lie, Every time you steal, every time you commit immorality, every time that you do anything that is in rebellion against the Word of God and God's commands, it's all written down against you. Yes, it is. God's got your record up there in mind too. And the only way to get that record blotted out is Acts 3.19. Repent and be converted that your sins may be blotted out or God will judge you throw you into hell with the rest of those that have rebelled against the Lord. Now God said here, there's a day He's going to judge the world in righteousness. By who? By Jesus. The man whom He ordained and has given assurance to us that He's going to do it because He raised Him from the dead to prove His power. If I can raise my dead son from the dead a lifeless body and put his life back in again, I can raise a hundred billion people and bring them into judgment. Amen. So don't think because they're dead, their ashes are scattered, the worms have eaten up their flesh, they've disintegrated and gone back into the dust, that I don't have power to resurrect them and to bring them alive before me in that great white throne judgment day when earth and heaven will be called together. Revelation 20 in verse 11, I saw a great white throne, and he that sat upon it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the book was open. The books were open. 
And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which are written in the books according to the works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Let me tell you something, ladies and gentlemen. There's a lot of joy in serving Jesus Christ. There's a lot of hardships that go along with it. But Jesus don't demand a halfway effort. He's not going to give you a thousand percent of reward for a fifty percent effort on your part. You can't come to Jesus Christ and give up part of your sins. And say, well, I'll give these up and I'll hold on to these that I'll have to do. God won't accept you. Remember on the job one time when I was younger working, a fellow told me about a black man that worked on the job. And he's speaking to the boss one morning. He said, boss man, I got saved last night. He said, Sam, I'm sure glad to hear that because he'd been cheating and gold breaking and everything else. And he said, how'd you get saved? He said, I went down that altar and I give up all my sins. He said, except one. Well, that except one is what will ruin you. You can't hang on to any sin and expect Jesus Christ to come into your life. A preacher one time, and this is not repentance, he said he stayed with some folks and heard a little girl in the family down praying. She got uh, whipped. And she went to bed saying her prayers. And she got out by the bed she was overheard praying. And this is not the kind of repentance that God accepts. Maybe the little girl, yes, but not you. She says, Lord, make me good. But wait a minute, Lord, not real good. Just good enough so I won't get another whip. That's just the way most people, Americans, like to live. If they live at all as a Christian. They want to live just good enough to stay out of God's judgment in hell and woodshed and so forth, but not good enough to really please the Lord. You're not going to get there like that. You won't make it like that. The story was told back also when I was a young minister in Arkansas. It's where I worked for eight years working out my apprenticeship. Bad place. I mean to have nothing. And I, we virtually had nothing. The story was told there about a fellow got saved back in the 30s before I came along. And uh, in the town they had a bar room. They had an old church, this old Methodist church. This is back, supposedly, I believe, in the 20s, by the way. And a fellow came to town preaching old-fashioned repentance, and the town was stirred. And one morning, one of the drunks came down through town, and he saw a horse. And he knew that horse belonged to one of his buddies that was a drinking buddy. And instead of tied at the saloon, you know, with the old-fashioned tying stake or post, he was tied over in front of the Methodist church. So he waited around until the fellow came out. He said, John said, how come you're tied up at the Methodist church instead of over in the saloon? He looked at him, he said, Sam... He said, I got saved over there last night. I repented. I give up my drinking and smoking and gambling and cursing and lying and fighting in the whole mess. And he says, I've changed hitching posts. Yeah. Oh, praise God. Yeah. That's what you do That's when it. you repent. Praise you change God. hitching posts. Right. You don't hitch up to them same places anymore. Yeah. You're not the same person you used to be. Praise God. Praise God. Like the song the trio sings here many times about Thanks to Calvary, I don't live there anymore. The then my little boy asked me what it was tears streamed down my face. I tried to tell them, thanks to Calvary, I don't go there anymore. The fellow went back to the old saloon or place where he used to go, and they asked him, said, why don't you come back anymore? He said, I tried to tell them, thanks to Calvary, I don't come there around these places anymore. And then his little boy when he come home after he got saved, he run and hid behind the door. And he said, son, don't be afraid. You've got a new daddy now. Thanks to Calvary, I don't go there. I don't do what I did anymore. Amen. Praise the Lord. I tell you, Calvary makes a difference when you repent. Amen. When a man gets on his knees, a woman, a poor girl, a drunk, a prostitute, a fornicator, Somebody can't live among people.
people like old maniac or Gadara that Jesus called out from the tombs that cut himself, had no clothes on. When you get saved, he'll make the gals and the boys put clothes on. Yes, amen. You'll want to be dressed right. Yeah. Praise God, you will hate nudity. You want to show your flesh. Oh, it makes a difference when you get to Calvary. And you're not going to find Calvary without repenting. Repentance to God and then faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. It'll bring you into divine favor and make a new person out of you. The Bible says again in 2 Peter 3, verse 9, God is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Amen. And I'll tell you, don't make any difference what church it is. God wrote one Bible. He has one way. And that way is the cross. Bow the cross. Renounce your sins. Accept the Lord as your master. Yes. Your master. Yes. Amen. And don't hang on to no sin because He won't accept you unless you give them all up. They all have to be forsaken, Amen. renounced, and walked away from. Repentance is much more than some of these things that sometimes we think is a suggestion. It's an, it's an imperative from Christ. It's a command. Jesus said, All men must repent, or they would perish in hell, from which there is no deliverance. God put great stress on His people living a life of true repentance. The only way to obtain His divine favor. In 2 Chronicles 7, verses 13 and 14, God said, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray, and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. And the church today is full of world conformity and idolatry. Amen. Full of drunkenness and fornication. Amen. Full of rebellion yes. against the word of God. Yes. God said if my people will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and repent. Turn from their wicked ways. Yes. Then will I hear from heaven. And I'll forgive their sin there when they repent. And only, and will heal their land yes. through repentance. And that's the only way to have favor with God. Only way back to God. Only way of restoration. We must return to the Lord only through repentance. Jeremiah, great prophet in his day, the church of old that Jesus came to and they received him not. In Jeremiah 8 and 6, he said, I hearkened and I heard, but they spake not aright. No man repented him of his wickedness, saying, What have I done? Everyone turned to his course as the horse rushes into the battle. And here's the kind of people the church was in the days of the prophets. And it's like that today, ladies and gentlemen. Yea, the stork in the heaven knoweth her appointed times. The turtle, the crane, and the swan observe the time of their coming. But my people don't know the judgments of the Lord. God's own people today, preachers tell them, God just loves everybody. Homosexuals, lesbians, fornicators, drunks, idolaters, revelers, cursers, smokers, drinkers, the whole shebang! I want to tell you one thing. If God does love the individual, He'll send them to hell for that sin in their life. There's a wonderful story in the Bible that illustrates God's... In, in drama, God illustrates what repentance means. That's in the prodigal son in Luke 15. The Bible said a certain man had two sons. The younger said to his father, Give me what's mine. I'm leaving home. He took off. Jesus told this parable of a son here to dramatize what he really meant by the word repent. When the prodigal son truly repented, he didn't just get off and sit still and feel sorry about all of his sins like a lot of folks today. They just get off and feel sorry. I've talked to people who didn't know I was a preacher, didn't know I was a Christian on bus, on an airplane, in restaurants and places where they didn't know me. People with all kinds of sins in their lives and hang-ups and many of them claim to be Christians and when they didn't know I was a preacher, didn't know I was a Christian and didn't know I was a homeless person, they'd tell me about their sordid life and their misery and their guilt and their shame but just as soon as they find out if I was a preacher they'd clam up and start justifying the stupid low down sins that they'd committed you're not going to cover that sin from God that prodigal son it led him to disaster 
led him to poverty. It led him to shame. It led him in the hog pen. But the Bible said he came to himself. Isn't that wonderful? That's the greatest part of that verse. Amen. Or that story Jesus told. Verse 17 in Luke 15. When he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my fathers have bread enough in despair, and I perish with hunger? What did he say further? I will arise and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned. God, what a confession. What an act of repentance. And he said, I've sinned against heaven, against God and before thee. I'm not worthy to be called your son. Make me one of the hired servants. He came to himself. See, that's, that's the true work of the Holy Spirit of God is to bring you to your senses. That you're lost. You're going to hell. You're living a life of shame. You're in the hog pen. That wretched condition of terrible sins against God, against humanity. He didn't sit there and feel sorry for him. He didn't remain in a limp condition or act passive. He didn't stay where he was, surrounded by the hogs. He got up and left the hog pen. That's what you have to do when you repent. You leave the hog pen. Amen. You leave your sins. Praise you leave your environment Amen. that's creating the circumstances that draws you. That's a magnetism to you. Get away from it. Amen. God won't accept you until you do. Praise I don't give a hoot what church you belong to, what catechism or what orthodoxy you submitted to. You're not saved until you renounce your sins Amen. and quit them. Right. And walk Amen. away from the hog pen you've lived in. Praise be to God. <laughs> he sought out his father and humbled himself before him. And then he got his reward. But not until. Ladies and gentlemen, there's one thing that true repentance involves that most people will not renounce. And that is their will. That old stubborn will hangs them on to their sins and their idolatry. Their world conformity and their rebellion against the Word of God and His holiness and true commandments. The will of the prodigal son had to be broken. The words of the prodigal son says, I will arise. Amen. I will say to my Father, I have sinned against heaven and against thee. I will humble my heart and quit my sinning. I will leave this hog pen. You're not saved until you will. That will is involved or you sit and perish. That's right. Praise God. There's not one verse in the Holy Scriptures of your Bible that indicates that you can be a Christian and live any kind of a life that you choose. That's right. You're not a Christian when you choose your life. You've got to go for the Word of God. When Christ comes into the human heart, He demands that He be Lord and Master. His demand is complete surrender to His will. Complete and total surrender. <laughs> He even demands control of your intellectual process, by the way. Your mind. The Bible says be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Amen. The Bible says you must have the mind of Christ. Amen. That means God must take control of your intellectual process. Christ demands that your body be subject to Him and to Him alone. You were not made for fornication, but for the Lord. The Scripture demands in 1 Corinthians 6. Your body was not made for fornication. It was made for the Lord. And God said if you commit fornication, I'll destroy it. Amen. You think God meant it? Of course He meant it. God demands your talents and your abilities when you come to Christ. He don't ask for them. He demands it. He demands that all your work and labor be performed in His name and for His glory. Not for yours. Is eternal life worth all of this? If it's not, it's not worth anything and you'll never have it. Christ demands more than just a passive consent to the nature of God and the demands of God, the commandments of God. Like the prodigal son, you must leave the hog pen to be saved. Jesus has a warning in the Scriptures. I want to call your attention to it here. In passing, in the 14th chapter of Luke, these are the words of Christ. Verse 25, said, There went great multitudes with Christ, and He turned and said unto them, If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother, his wife and children, his brothers and sisters, yea, in his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Is a Bible writer or is a preacher right or some theologian right that tells you otherwise? The Bible says in Romans 3, 3 and 4, Let God be true, 
Let God's word be true in every man a liar. Amen. Anybody, any preacher that don't speak what God speaks is a liar. Amen. Amen. You'll go to hell listening to some phony. Amen. Jesus said you got to hate. Now, this is a comparative thing. The Lord always uses comparative things. In other words, your love for your parents and wife and children and everything must be compared as hate to your great love that you have for Christ or you cannot be His disciple. Alright, listen to the next verse. And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me, he cannot be my disciple. You know what a cross is? This is your will, and here's God's will that crosses you and I up. And that cross means that you're going to have to take it, and God crosses out your will, and His will must overcome your will. Amen. There's a cross there. Your sure will is. and God's. Sure is. There's enmity that the cross will break down, that you can perform the will of God in your life. All right, verse 27. Continuing in Luke 14. Listen to this. And whosoever, Jesus said, doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Alright, verse 33. So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. you got to give up that kind of life that you enjoy living. The pleasures of sin for a season, as Hebrews 11 said, Moses forsook the pleasures of sin for a season. He knew sin had pleasure, but he counted it loss that he might gain Christ in eternal life. And then you find real happiness in Christ. Pleasure has its dregs and its leaves. You reap what you sow in the flesh. But in the cup that you accept from Christ, there is no leaves and no dregs, no leftovers. Nothing to be reaped. It's a cup of happiness. And happiness is a condition of the heart and not the satisfaction of your carnal desires. <laughs> Jesus didn't say, you got to give up a few things. He said, give it all. Now don't try to do it part way and hope you're going to get by Christ. No, sir, God will judge you for it. Don't say, I'll give up some of my sins and hang on to some other sins. I'll live part of my life for Jesus and part of my life on my own desires. There's no reward. Don't expect Jesus to give you that 500% reward for a 50% effort. It will never work now and especially in eternity. We get down then to the church of the end time. The church in which we're living and what Jesus says about it. And there's a great revelation in, Re in the book of Revelation, the third chapter, the church at Laodicea. Jesus said in verse 15, I know thy works. That thou art neither cold nor hot, I would thou wert cold or hot. So because you're lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because you say, this is a church of the end time. There's seven churches in these two chapters of Revelation 2 and 3. The Laodicean church is the church of the end time in which we're living. A church, the lukewarm church. And here's the lukewarmness expressed so succinctly here by the great apostle. You say you're rich, you're increased with good, you have need of nothing, see? And knowest not that you're wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I counsel thee to buy me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich in white raiment that you may be clothed and your, the shame of your nakedness do not appear. Anoint thine eyes with eye salve that you may see. The eye salve of the Spirit is the Word of God. So your spiritual understanding and eyes will be open to see that true repentance ever leads to heaven and rejection. Refuse to repent and give up your sins is a sure road to hell and to perishing forever. And Jesus says, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous therefore, church, and repent. Amen. The church of today has got to repent and That's turn right. back from their sins or God's Amen. going... To let them perish. And he says, listen here. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. I'm still, Christ is on the outside. He's knocking. Hey church, I'm out. I've spewed you out of my mouth. I won't back in. Now, it's boiled down, not to a group, but to the individual. If any man hear my voice and open the door, that's to your heart, 
I will come in and will sup with him and him with me and to him that overcometh. Will I grant to sit with me in my throne? Overcome what? Overcome the world, the flesh, sin, and the devil. And you're going to overcome it or perish. I'll grant you, if you overcome, to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame, and have sat down with my Father in His throne, He that hath an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. Yes. You better hear this. Right. You better hear this. There's a lot of forsaking, renouncing, giving up things, turning your back on them, walking off out the hog pen of sin and pleasure and idolatry, rebellion against God, turn away from those lusts, from that love of the world, from that love of pleasure, from that love of money, from that love of sex, that love of drink, that love of reveling and song, that love of cigarettes, that love of nudity and selfishness and egotism and lying and cursing, and let me get down to one that's ruining a lot of Christians. Repent and forsake that old bad attitude you carry around with you. Yes, It'll amen. ruin you. Yes, amen. A lot of Christians have a terrible attitude. Yes, they do. Every time you meet them, you don't know what you're going to meet. Yes. One time their attitude's good, the next time they're rotten as a devil. Mm. Let me tell you, Christ is not going to put up that he spew you out of his mouth. That's right. You better repent and forsake that old bad attitude. Yes. And keep that attitude. That's a good spirit, in other words. Amen. Keep your spirit good. Yeah. Keep a spirit that God can touch and even man doesn't come along and irritate you and make a fool out of you because of your wrong concept, yeah. your blindness hey. to see your need. And you go around and say, I have need of nothing. And know not that you're miserable and wretched and blind and poor and naked and spewed out of the mouth of Jesus Christ. And the only way back into restoration is true repentance. Yes. Renounce what you're doing and do it about faith and go the other way and do the thing that God commands you to do and then you will receive divine favor, forgiveness. And you'll be restored as the prodigal son back to that sonship Back to that wonderful inheritance that he forfeited when he took what he could get and made his way into a far country. And there dissipated his father's living on harlots in riotous living. And when he spent all, he came to walk. And he went and joined himself to the citizen of that country. And, the, and, that, and he desired to eat the husk which the hogs did eat, and no man would give him. And he sent him in the field to feed the swine. And after many days, the Bible said he came to himself. And he said, I have sinned. I'm going to go back to my Father. I'm going to say, I've sinned against heaven and against you, Father. And I'm not worthy to be your son any longer. And Jesus spoke of that in a parable before the prodigal son story. In the same chapter, Luke 15 and verse 10. And he says, I tell you in heaven there is joy over one sinner that repenteth than over 99 persons that don't need to repent. There's joy in heaven when a person repents that's got sin in their life. When he comes before God in Christ, he confesses it. He renounces it. He forsakes it. He accepts God's divine mercy. And he turns his back on it and walks away with the fetters and the shackles broken Praise by the God. power of Jesus Christ. Yes, amen. And he goes out and lives a different life. Praise the Lord. And the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature, creation or creature. Amen. All things pass away, and behold, all things become new. Amen. You see a new heaven yes. and a new earth for you. You see a new person as you look into the mirror. Thanks to Calvary. I'm not the man I used to be. Thanks to Calvary, I'm not the mom, the dad, the son, or the daughter I used to be. Thanks to Calvary, I don't do the things I used to do and go to the places I used to go. Thanks to Calvary, the dogs and the cats knows I've repented and found peace with God through my Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, amen. I ain't no joke. You have a change of heart that changes your whole personality. Your attitude changes. Your intellectual processes are affected. Yeah. That you don't think in terms that you used to think. Your eyes are open to see the beauty 
of the righteousness of Jesus Christ and the beauty of His creation. You see it in a new dimension that you never saw it before. You can enjoy life in a fuller content than you ever enjoyed it and ever had the possibility of when you repented and truly renounced your egotism, your idolatry, your love for the world, and all of these selfish little items that wrapped you up in a little package of egotism. You renounce that. There's one thing that God brings that's so wonderful. When a person truly repents and finds Christ, He breaks his selfishness. You begin to look on things of others instead of the things for yourself. Your old attitude becomes so different that people don't recognize it. But thanks be unto God for His unspeakable gift, for the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. For that wonderful scripture, Proverbs 28, 13. He that covereth his sins shall not prosper. But whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. Jesus again, hear him saying, Nay, I say unto you, except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. What a warning from our blessed Lord and Master. My God, let us take heed to this warning and forsake and turn away, renounce and leave at the altar the sins that are going to ruin us sooner or later. Don't believe God's tolerant. God's not tolerant to let you by. He's just long-suffering. He's keeping your record. He's holding back that judgment that you're so deserving of. But sooner or later it will fall on you and destroy you if you don't turn from your sins in true repentance. Yes. And I beg you in the name and person of Jesus Christ to turn before iniquity becomes your ruin in the name of our Lord and Master. Turn before it's too late. Shall we pray? Our Father and our God, we ask you in the name of Jesus to touch every heart and soul here and those that will listen to video cassette. Lord, grip their heart. Catch them in the power of something outside and beyond themselves. Caught in the grip of divine power and persuasion to turn them. Turn them to the kingdom of God. Turn them to old-fashioned repentance. For Lord, they'll not be accepted into the kingdom of God except they repent and receive Christ as their Lord and Master. Lord, there's no compromising about this matter. They can't halfway do it. They've got to give up all sin. They've got to turn their back on every sin and quit sinning. And I pray in the name of Jesus, the Holy Ghost will convict and reprove. And the goodness of God will lead many to repent. Because it's repent or perish in hell. And what a terrible fate for people who rebel against the commands of our great Creator God and our Lord and Master Jesus Christ. To you be the glory for everything that's accomplished through this message, Lord. Because you said, if I be lifted up, and I, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. Many are drawn, but they don't renounce their stubborn and selfish wills. May the wills be broken of hundreds and thousands and a turning to Christ, the renouncing of their sins and walking away with the shackles broken, the shackles of sin. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> So
Surely you will fear me, saith the Lord. I am he that destroyed the old world of Noah, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. I am he that turned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemning them with an overthrow, and making them an example to all those that after shall live ungodly. I am he that spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness, and reserved them unto the judgment of that great day. Yea, thou art appointed for death in the judgment, your flesh and breath, and I, the Lord, would judge thee. I have made thee in mine image. You are created for my glory. Therefore turn, saith the Lord, from all your sins before they ruin you. And I bring you into judgment and destroy thee because of your rebellion. I am the Lord. That is my name. And I will have mercy upon those that turn to me and repent of their sins. So turn, saith the Lord, for I have no delight in the death of him that dieth. Turn and live ye. For there is my will, saith the Lord thy God. Thank you. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Thank you. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Holy Ghost, draw hearts. Yes, Lord. In Jesus' name. To old fashioned repentance. Thank you, Lord. Let us all stand. Is someone here without a song? <coughs>